Hello, thank you so much for the opportunity to share so, some thoughts from the US about Living History Farms and their role in seeking sustainability. There are plenty of critics of Living History Farms for good reason. Some believe it's their escapist destinations, others that they are a remarkable educational opportunities. I happen to be the latter. I have, I am Curator of Agriculture and the Environment at the Henry Ford, and it's my duty to ensure that the, the or strive to have the living history farms that I work with and relate to seek the highest standards, moving beyond nostalgic oases and towards institutions notable for their preservation of tangible and intangible cultural heritage, moving beyond their perception as a rustic retreat and towards being a think tank to engage the public. And most of all, in terms of cultural and social sustainability, moving beyond being reminders of inequity and towards serving as catalysts to envision an equitable and regenerative future. Agriculture is at the heart of the knowledge, skills, assets that Living History Farms and agricultural museums, open air museums have. Think of it as agricultural history, the heart of a compass rose and the topics that radiate out from that related to agriculture, but obviously not just agriculture as the, 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 the sources of, for the, the quest of the provocation. Assets include and from which knowledge and skills grow include material culture, the artifacts, nature archives, what environmental historians are increasingly calling evidence of both the, the biosphere, the soil samples that document changes in that, that uh, earth mantle over time, but also archival evidence of humans and the ways they're changing in response to environmental change over time. Other assets include more the skills level of agriculture, that immaterial culture that is essential in museum preservation. And then the call to action, which we need to work on more questions about the biosphere's capacity to mediate the greenhouse gases associated with the great acceleration, the Anthropocene, global warming, and moving towards regenerative action, returning, moving beyond net zero to positive change. And we have many organizations that help us do this. One of them is the Agricultural History Society, where knowledge from its beginning, well, yes, in 1919, sought deeper understanding of social, cultural, labor, ethnicity contexts, but also for living history form formation. Uh, this early symposium at the National Colonial Farm, which dedicated itself to trying to document farming in the tidewater, including animal husbandry, plant science, but also labor in the context of enslavement and the meaning of that for agricultural history and for societal foundations inequity at, at, at its heart. The 1970 symposium at Old Sturbridge Village launched ALFAM, which today exists to combine knowledge and skills with its members. As an example of a case study, a living history farm begun in 18, or 1985, moved to Greenfield Village then, and opened, I should say, as the interpretive focus, Harvey Firestone, the industrialist, it's his birthplace. This, if we have plenty of knowledge supporting this interpretation and lots of skill among the presenters, what we are working towards, at least, yes, is the advocacy, the ways it can help people understand where they are on the planet, but more importantly, who was there before in terms of indigenous peoples and the labor systems that facilitated that farm 
at the time Harvey Firestone was a child. The combination helps us, uh, helps us move towards sustainability and regenerative practices, but we have a long way to go. One of the other major efforts at the Henry Ford is our edible education initiative, which is a reconstructed public market building from downtown Detroit. This reconstruction will address urban agriculture across time from the, eight, from the mid 19th, 19th century to the present, and also prompt thought about food security and envisioning a sustainable food future. As we move closer to who worked in this building, then who, who the growers are today that keep us all fed and what a regenerative system can be in the future in the Great Lakes and beyond. This is a tall order. It's going to take time, but, and it, and, and it is an opportunity to explore the potential of agricultural museums, living history farms, and social, cultural, and environmental sustainability. Thank you. I look forward to questions. Hello. It is my pleasure now to welcome you to the second part of our joint presentation. My name is Klaus Krupp, and I am the manager of the Lauritsen Laboratory for Experimental Archaeology. After we had a closer look at the role of living history farms when it comes to connecting the public to agriculture, food systems, and the environment, I now want to highlight the special role archaeological open air museums have when it comes to coping with past agricultural systems and how that relates to modern day challenges in sustainability. I want to do so by using a case study. And in this case, the Laurasan Laboratory for Experimental Archaeology, which I have the pleasure to manage for almost 10 years now. As part of an introduction, I want to give you a little hint of what the site is all about. Basically, it's a scale one-to-one -one model of an early medieval memorial site focusing on the Carolingian era, so basically around 800 AD. And it is built to function as a, an educational site for visitors to get a vivid and lively impression of that era to get an impression of how that buildings might have looked like, get an impression how that past agricultural system looked like and worked, and also um, a sense of the surroundings of a memorial site like this, be it agricultural fields, meadows, gardens, livestock, plants. At the same time, Laurasam is also a serious research facility dedicated to experimental archaeological research. And that is what I especially want to focus on now. The interesting part of our approach is that we take all available sources of that past agricultural system, in that case of the early Middle Ages, have a look at what we know of field conditions, what we know of innovations like plows, the moldboard plow, for example, um, but also field systems like the ridge and furrow system. We look at written evidence, we look at iconographic evidence, and we put all this through our experimental archaeological research. It basically works or functions as a set of glasses. We look through a filter, we look through, and doing so, we try to squeeze out relevant information, relevant data we can use um, to connect them to modern day questions. So when we have a system of risk minimization strategies, we are able to get a hold of when we look at these past agricultural systems and which helped us understand that people were actually able to cope with climate extremes, then we have to try to um, squeeze all the relevant information out of there and uh, see if, if it is still relevant for today and even for tomorrow.
So I want to show you now what set of parameters we set out to get our glasses to the right strength and in order to have a valid and serious filter for our research. What you see at that slide is a set of parameters we set out when we have our research on the experimental fields. So we try to document soil moisture, we try to document soil humidity, weather um, conditions, we do yield analysis and soil analysis. We use modern day agricultural research tools and apply them on our experimental fields. So not only we try to monitor as much as possible, but also to make it comparable to modern day analyses, um, be it yield analysis. So when we use the same parameters for our yield analysis, as it is used for modern day agricultural um, research and yield analysis, we are able to compare these. And then we are actually able to, as I already said, um, to use our experimental archeological glasses right in order to get that sense of on these innovations of these techniques um, we want to learn from. Let me highlight this by using the example of our region furrow systems. This field system, which was first known in the early Middle Ages and which was still in place um, up until the 19th century in some um, regions of Europe, basically had the characteristic of a set of, well, ridges and furrows in combination with each other. Um, they were of great length up to one kilometer and uh, the height of the ridges was up to, well, 60 centimeters to one meter. And they could be created by plowing always to the middle of the field or by the so-called Plagenwirtschaft, which would mean that you would intentionally bring on soil um, to create these ridges. So what we did in the last five years, basically, on a more scientific level, is to monitor everything um, in the way I already described and to farm these ridge and furrows and to see what might have been the advantages or disadvantages of these systems. While the required draft animal power is quite high, we are actually able to see and understand that this was a really interesting system of risk minimization strategies combined um, in one field system as the system was able to, well, guarantee always an average type of yield, no matter if the year was especially hot and dry or wet, because in a very dry year, the yield in the furrows was up to double as high as on the ridges, while in a very moist and rainy year, the yield on the ridges would be double as high as in the furrows. So especially while living through the 21st century climate um, change caused extremes of the last years, we saw that these past field systems we are trying to construct and research actually guaranteed um, some sort of um, sustainable yield for these past farmers and even for um, modern day farmers. By summing up, I think we can agree that this experimental archaeological research and the combination of public engagement in a museum setting can really play an important role in translating these data sets into our modern day setting and challenges. Thank you for your attention.